Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, and yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. From the beginning of time, there is a presence and a persistence of song. The heavens declare, the trees clap their hands, and the rivers make music to the glory of God's name and for our reassurance of God's abiding, loving, and creative hand. Even within the restrictive, disorienting season of many uncertainties related to COVID-19, we are assured that this world is of our Heavenly Father. If only through listening ears, all nature sings the music of the spheres. Welcome to anyone willing, able, and privileged to receive the gift of this recital, diligently prepared and graciously shared by the efforts and gifting of Marvin Blickenstaff. English poet John Keats wrote, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. It comes to us as an endless fountain of immortal drink poured from the heaven's brink. Marvin Blickenstaff, the person, the craftsman and artist, instructor and mentor, is a joy to this world and certainly to those of us pri privileged to share some part of his life with ours. We gather virtually this day in honor and celebration of Marvin's 85th birthday this Tuesday, May 19. The, this was originally a public recital and now obviously adapted to meet current virus restraints in protective measures. But fortunately, music does possess the quality of persistence, transcending time and space and circumstance of life and death. What power! What reassurance and life-giving gift for humanity. Marvin reflects that same life-giving persistence as well and has sought to give to all, his all, in performance, in instruction, in mentoring, often serving, I would suspect, as a life coach, always as a child of God, a disciple of Jesus, and patriarch for the arts in the public concert hall, classroom, and church sanctuary. Recently, unknown to Marvin, featured articles were contributed in honor of Marvin's milestone birthday and career in Piano Magazine, spring 2020. Reading just one short submission by a friend and professional colleague captures not only Marvin's giftedness as an educator, but even the greater source of his success, that is a human being of the highest qualities, which no doubt ground, inspire, and impassion his performance and his educating. Mr. Blickenstaff is widely known and respected among piano teachers throughout the nation and has received the highest honors for his unparalleled teaching abilities, yet he remains one of the most humble, supportive, and encouraging people I know. He is a masterful teacher, yes, but he is much more than that. He is a mentor and a lifelong friend. Marvin, we are delighted for your presence as a friend as a musician of utmost caliber, one who has, is now, and will continue to grace this world with beauty, buoyant and unbound. This time is yours. Blessings, gratitude, and happy birthday. Well, Play you. on. I thank you, Michael. Um, as the 85th birthday approached, I thought to myself, how, how do I really want to celebrate this? And I thought, I would just love to play a recital. So I uh, got pieces together and uh, uh, was going to offer this recital to my friends in Princeton where I teach and also here at Blooming Glen. And then a little germ got in the way uh, and so all those plans had to be changed some uh, rather radically as a matter of fact. But we're here today and I would love to share some, some music with you. Um, these are some of my favorite pieces that I've learned over the years and I hope you will enjoy the music. The first piece that I'm going to play is a, a nocturne by the famous composer Chopin. In fact, there are several pieces by Chopin on this program. And I suppose you could say that Chopin is my very favorite composer, although it's, little, it's difficult for me to determine who is my very favorite composer. When Chopin was living in Paris, 
he jotted off a, a new composition and sent it to his sister who was living in Warsaw, Poland. Interestingly enough, the composition did not have a title on it. And she wrote him and said, uh, you don't have a title on this. She said, I've played it over. It's really a beautiful piece. I think it's a nocturne. Uh, Chopin wrote 19 nocturnes, and they are some of his most beautiful lyrical music. And so uh, when the piece was published, finally, it bore the, the title Nocturne. So this is a, a nocturne by Chopin in C-sharp minor. The next two pieces are by Schumann. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm very sorry. The next two pieces are by Schubert. <laughs> There's a Schumann piece coming up. <laughs> anyway, two uh, impromptus by Schubert. Uh, Schubert uh, lived in Vienna at the same time as uh, Beethoven. Uh, he was completely overshadowed by the huge reputation of Beethoven. Uh, uh, so he had a hard time making a living out of his compositions. In those days, there were no royalty contracts signed when a composer would uh, offer a composition to a publisher. The publisher would buy the composition. 
uh, so Schubert would dash off something so that he would have something for supper that evening and, uh, uh, and try to sell a composition to a, a publisher. So he wrote these, and actually there are eight of these impromptus published at different times. Uh, but uh, the, the second of the impromptus is what I want to talk about. The first impromptu is in A flat, the second is in G flat. Uh, so Schubert uh, wrote this G flat impromptu took it to the publisher, and uh, he said, I have a beautiful piece that I would like for you to publish. And the publisher looked at the piece and he said, well, it really is a nice piece, he said, but I could never publish that. And Schubert <laughs> looked ag ag aghast and he said, but it's such a beautiful piece. And the publisher said, but it's in G flat major. Nobody will buy a piece that has six flats in the key signature. And, and Schubert said, but it's so beautiful. The publisher thought a little bit and said, tell you what I'll do. I'll transpose it and publish it in G major with one sharp. And then, uh, and then people will be more prone to, to purchase it because it's in an easier key. Schubert said, you can't do that. The piece is in G flat major. Now that statement uh, belies the fact that composers have very special feelings about the key that they write their piece in. And Schubert was just absolutely astonished that anybody would think of publishing his piece in a, in a key other than for what it was intended. Schubert needed the money, so the, the publisher said, well, take it or leave it. You know, I'll either transpose it or I will not publish it. And Schubert needed the money so badly that he uh, allowed the publisher to uh, publish it in a transposed key. Later, of course, the world came to know this piece as a wonderful impromptu in G flat major. Two Schubert impromptus, uh, the first one in A flat major and the second one in G flat major.
Now for the G flat major impromptu, there's actually a special Blooming Glen story behind this piece. Yeah. Um, uh, when I was new uh, to this congregation, Michael asked me to play for a service one time, and I was supposed to play prelude and offertory. And I thought that this G flat uh, 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 impromptu by Schubert would be a wonderful offertory. Little did I realize that this piece is seven or eight minutes long, and an offertory here at Blooming Glen only takes two and a half or three minutes. And so the piece went on and on and on. I usher stood back, you know, wondering what in the world's going on. Michael biting his nails. <laughs> I, I feel fortunate that he has re-invited me to play for some of the services.
It really does sound different in G major. <laughs> As Schubert so wisely knew, that's the only key for this piece. Now I'm going to play a piece by Schumann, a German, North, North German composer, who lived uh, uh, several decades after Schubert in Vienna. Um, this happens to be an F sharp major. Now, those of you who know a little bit about music theory realize that actually, if you were to play an F sharp major chord and a G flat major chord, they would sound exactly alike. They are really the same thing, except one is written in sharps and the other is written in flats. This is a romance in F sharp major by Schumann. Uh, uh, Schumann was deeply in love uh, with a, a young woman uh, uh, who was a f budding concert pianist in, in uh, Germany. Uh, they married, ha had a nice family. He wrote lots of music for her to perform in concerts uh, and, and to be published uh, for the rest of the world to enjoy. This, this romance in F sharp major, I think has special appeal because the main melody is in the tenor register. And there's something about the warmth of the middle register of the piano, that tenor, that cello register, that is especially compelling. So this is the romance in F sharp major by Schumann.
couple of pieces by Chopin now. Um, Chopin was a fabulous pianist himself, and he, his fingers could do re literally anything on, on the keyboard. He wrote 24 etudes, or studies, and they're some of the hardest pieces that have been written. Um, most of them have uh, particular finger difficulties, but there's one piece, and I'm playing that now for you, that uh, the, uh, the difficulty lies in the fact that there are two simultaneous melodies going on. Because of that, a, a tenor melody and a soprano melody, it's sometimes nicknamed the cello and the flute etude uh, because of, of the two simultaneous melodies. So this is a Chopin etude, opus 25, number seven, uh, uh, nicknamed the cello and the flute etude by Chopin. I'm going to follow that up uh, with the famous fantasy impromptu. Uh, pianists would enjoy playing the fantasy impromptu if it were just for the first section of the piece. It's very obviously outlined in an A, B, A form. Uh, the, um, uh, and when I get to the B section, you will recognize that immediately. In about 1917, somebody took this melody for the B section uh, uh, of, of the Chopin etude and, um, uh, and put words to it for I'm Always Chasing Rainbows. So that became a part of a Broadway musical in 1917, and then Judy Garland made it uh, much more famous uh, when uh, she was in a show on Broadway, I think it was called Zigfield Girl, and she sang I'm Always Chasing Rainbows. Two Chopin pieces, uh, the Fantasy Impromptu uh, is the second piece, and the Chopin Etude, the Cello and the Flute is the first.
The next piece I'm going to play is by an American composer, Aaron Copland. Some of you know Appalachian Springs and Rodeo. And, uh, Aaron, Aaron Copland was a, a major, major American composer in uh, the early part of this century. Like a lot of uh, co American composers who became very famous composers, like, for instance, Leonard Bernstein, uh, they went to Paris to study with uh, a, a woman by the name of Nadia Boulanger, who was such a great teacher, not a piano teacher, but a teacher of composition. And Aaron Copland studied with her, and while he was in Paris, he wrote this, this piece and dedicated it to her. The title of the piece is Passacaglia. Now, it's a big Italian word uh, that has a, a vast music history to it. Uh, even before Bach's time, composers, uh, especially in North Germany, were writing passacaglias. What a passacaglia is, is actually as a sort of a theme and variation. Uh, the bass line states the theme, and then the uh, other parts provide the, the variations for that. And that happens, uh, obviously, in this piece. Uh, uh, so Copeland states a theme, uh, and, and then writes a, a four or five minute piece uh, of variations on top of that theme. Um, the theme is about 15 notes long, and I don't expect you to remember that, but I do expect, I want you to listen to the first four notes. Step. Uh, the, uh, so that is stated over and over again. Sometimes he plays it backwards, sometimes he plays it a lot faster than that, but every moment of the piece has that uh, theme in, in the bass. Uh, and, and then, as I say, uh, the, the upper parts are the variations on top of that. This is the Passacaglia by Aaron Copeland.
Uh, one more piece by Chopin, uh, and then uh, a couple of pieces by Liszt, and that will be end, end the program. Um, we mentioned in the Pasacalla that there was a bass theme that keeps coming over and over again, and then it's like a set of variations on top of that. Um, Chopin wrote a composition called Versus. Uh, in French, uh, the word Versus is a lullaby, uh, or cradle song. Um, in, in this particular composition, Chopin creates a kind of a mu musical hypnosis because there's just two chords that rock back and forth. It's like you're rocking a baby to sleep. Those two chords, tonic and dominant, and tonic and dominant. And that persists literally throughout the piece. And the right hand then has some wonderful, wonderful figurations above that. And at the end, we hope the baby is asleep.
Most musicians and music historians would agree that Franz Liszt was the greatest pianist ever to have lived. He really could do anything. Uh, he was a bright man, uh, well-educated, uh, but played the piano like nobody else. Um, he was sort of a citizen of all Europe. He was born in Hungary, uh, lived in Austria and in Germany and in France and Switzerland for a while and spent years, very pleasant years for him in Italy. While Liszt was living in Italy, he steeped himself in Italian literature, loved reading the Italian authors and became especially fond of the sonnets by the medieval Italian poet Petrarch. He was especially fond of three of these Patriarch sonnets, and he set the words for voice and piano, for male voice and piano. Uh, they were not very popular and were not being sung very often, and so he decided that he could make uh, use of that effort uh, by transcribing them for piano solo, and that's how they're best known today, although there are vocalists who will sing the, the Liszt's uh, Patriarch sonnets uh, on, on song recitals. I'm playing, uh, uh, it has a strange name, it's, it's uh, Patriarch sonnet number 104. <laughs> uh, and if you're not up on your Patriarch sonnets, look it up, 104. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a love sonnet. And uh, uh, in the poet tells, uh, describes in this sonnet how love has just turned his world upside down. He doesn't know whether he's hot or cold. He doesn't know whether it's day or night. Uh, 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 it's, it, love has just completely transformed his life and he hardly knows uh, where he's going. The second piece that I'm going to play uh, by Liszt is one of Liszt's transcendental etudes. Now that, that title uh, for these etudes describe a little bit about the difficulty of these, of transcendental difficulty, uh, with the exception of the one that I'm going to play, which is not all that difficult. Uh, uh, most of the transcendental day twos I could hardly even touch. But this is a beautiful piece and I have enjoyed learning this and, and, and playing this. Um, the title uh, uh, of this transcendental etude is Evening Harmonies. It starts out with some bell tones. It's like church bells almost. And I'm reminded of, of a painting that I grew up with called The Angelus. And it shows a peasant farmer and his wife out in the field evening time and they have bowed heads because the church bell is ringing that it's evening time and it's time to go home and pray. Uh, so that's how this piece begins. And it it just gets bigger and bigger and it's like the sky opens up uh, and has the most glorious, radiant colors. And finally, evening comes and sets in and the piece dies down. So two final pieces by Franz Liszt, uh, the, the love sonnet uh, by, uh, based on Petrarch's words and then evening harmonies.
Marvin, you have reached that stage of life where you have a birthday party and you say, please, no gifts. You have given us a gift. You're listening and watching, viewing audience, and we do hope that you will take time to watch and listen and enjoy and find nourishment for your soul. You have demonstrated for us, Marvin, that biblical principle where righteousness and peace kiss, where you have taken the discipline of your craft and joined it with the passion and pleasure of your craft. You have contended, you have wrestled with the disciplines that only fellow musicians or pianists could fully appreciate all that goes in, taking complexities and making them accessible to us. And that demonstrates a command of contentment. So we're grateful that that is your pleasure and that you have been willing to share that with us. God bless you. Thank you, Mark. God bless you. A virtual standing ovation. Okay. Thank you, our friend. My Thank pleasure. You. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.